Good morning. My name is Dr Natalia Rossello and I'm going to speak to you today about adnexal masses in pregnancy. First of all I'd like to say uh, thank you to Bemis for inviting me to give this talk and I'm very sorry that I cannot be with you in person. So this is me, a good photograph admittedly, um, and I'm a specialty doctor in gynaecology. And over the last uh, 20 years, I've developed um, a niche in gynaecological scanning with special interests in endometriosis and ovarian masses and a passion for early pregnancy scanning. This is where I work at the Princess Anne Hospital in Southampton. And as you can see here, this is uh, the very glamorous picture of the Princess Royal that greets us every morning uh, when we come to work. So... Um, adnexal masses in pregnancy. This is quite a huge topic, as you can imagine, because any adnexal mass um, that you get, you can also get in pregnancy. Um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background, um, talk to you about uh, the types, um, and show you some images and videos of um, the most common types. And at the end, um, there should be time for some case presentations. Um, First of all, I'm just going to mention terminology. As you know, um, when we scan in gynaecology, it's really important to do, uh, firstly, a routine systematic scan, and um, secondly, very important, that we all try and speak the same language when we're describing our scans. And this paper um, was published in 2020 um, and um, was um, written um, from the Escher Working Group um, on ectopic pregnancy, which are leading names in um, ectopic pregnancy, and it just, it's the terminology for describing a normally cited and uh, normally cited and ectopic pregnancies on ultrasound, and I'll be using some of this uh, terminology uh, today. So let's start off with just describing what exactly is the adnexa. And the adnexa refers to the anatomical area adjacent to the uterus, consisting of the fallopian tube and the ovary, the associated um, vessels, ligaments, the broad ligament and the round ligament that support the uterus and connective tissue around it. And adnexal masses represent a range of conditions, both gynaecological and non-gynaecological, benign or malignant, and of course, they can also be related to the pregnancy itself. Recent advances, advances in routine imaging during pregnancy have led to an increase in the rate of detection of such masses. And the reported incidence of adnexal masses in pregnancy ranges from 1 in 81 to 1 in 8,000 pregnancies. The overall incidence of malignancy is between 1 in, in 1,500 to 3,200. And adnexal masses in pregnancy may be asymptomatic and just picked up um, on a routine scan, particularly as now we are encouraged not just to look at the pregnancy, but to look in the adnexa to see if there are any um, previously undiagnosed cysts or other masses. Ultrasound is the best um, initial imaging tool that we have of evaluating a pelvic mass. And both transabdominal scan and transvaginal scan can be used together as complementary techniques. More detailed assessment of the mass is much better using a transvaginal scan using the iota criteria, iota criteria especially in early pregnancy. And colour Doppler um, also helps us to distinguish from um, benign and malignant masses. So first of all, I think we should start off with pregnancy-related masses. Um, I will briefly go over um, ectopic pregnancy, hyperstimulated ovaries and thecal lutein cysts, and some ectopic masses, masses may be associated with a caesarean section scar. So ectopic pregnancies. If we scan in early pregnancy, any adnexal mass that we see um, should be considered um, as an ectopic pregnancy as the differential diagnosis. And as we know, that ectopic pregnancies can be intrauterine or extrauterine pregnancy. And those that can be described as an adnexal mass are either a tubal ectopic, an ovarian ectopic, or abdominal ectopic. These images here, the top one shows an ovarian ectopic pregnancy. This is the ovary here. We can see the outline and there is a hyperechoic mass seen within the ovary here. So no ovarian ectopic pregnancies. These are quite rare, 
but not as rare as an abdominal pregnancy, which we can see here. Here is the uterus, um, which shows no sign of intrauterine pregnancy. And then there is a large mass that we can see um, just here. And this um, actually was a 12 week, we can just see part of the embryo here, um, a 12 week um, um, abdominal pregnancy. Abdominal pregnancies um, can be um, primary or a secondary ectopic pregnancy. A primary um, is when it is um, when the ectopic pregnancy implants in the abdominal cavity um, and secondary can be after a rupture from a tube and then the ectopic pregnancy implants um, within the um, abdominal cavity um, or if it ruptured from a uterine anomaly such as um, the rudimentary horn in a unicorn uterus. However, most common, 90% um, of ectopic pregnancies are tubal. And um, a tubal ectopic pregnancy um, can be classified in two ways. Um, one with a solid um, mass. Uh, this used to be described as the blob sign. And one where you can see a natural gestation sac, um, which used to be described as a bagel sign. Um, within the gestational sac, in some ectopic pregnancies, you can see a yolk sac and a fetal pole, and rarely you can see cardiac activity uh, within the ectopic pregnancy. So I've got here some short videos. Um, as we know, scanning is about pattern recognition, um, and um, the more you scan, the more pregnancy, ectopic pregnancy you'll see and you'll recognise. So here what we can see is um, the ovary, and adjacent to the ovary and moving separately is this mass here, um, which contains a small gestation sac, and you can just about see a yolk sac there. There is some, um, this will be a tubal ectopic pregnancy, um, and there's some bleeding that we can see, some fluid um, just surrounding the ectopic pregnancy. Here we have another case where um, we can see the uterus and within the uterus we can see a small amount of intracavity fluid, it used to be called a pseudosac but now we call this intracavity fluid. And then looking in the right adnexa we can see the right ovary here and a small mobile mass consisting of a very small uh, gestational sac and this is one of the pregnancies that used to be called a bagel sign. Um, so this is a left tubal ectopic pregnancy. Moving on, here is another video, and this shows um, the right ovary here and an ectopic pregnancy with quite a large sac. Um, this woman was 10 weeks pregnant and she had had some acute pain about three weeks previously. Um, but hadn't seen the doctor, um, but had continued to bleed during that time. So she presented to the early pregnancy unit at 10 weeks. And we can see here that there is a fetal pole. There was no heartbeat. Um, she was taken to theatre and a left, uh, right salpingectomy was performed. Um, as I said, um, we can also get a live ectopic pregnancy. Um, here we can see a uterus with no evidence of intrauterine pregnancy, but in the left adnexa, uh, we can see the left ovary and adjacent to it is a mass with um, uh, quite strong peripheral vascularity and there was a small embryo with a heartbeat. Heterotropic pregnancies is where there is a, an intrauterine pregnancy, a normal sighted intrauterine pregnancy, and um, a, an ectopic pregnancy, most commonly a tubal ectopic pregnancy in the same patient. This is a rare event, um, but it's become much more common in recent years um, with women undergoing reproductive um assisted reproductive um, techniques, they have a 1-2% to 2 chance of a heterotropic pregnancy if more than one embryo um, is transferred, transferred. So there should be a very high index of suspicion um, in patients um, with a normally sighted pregnancy with an adnexal mass. And this is the reason why we should um, be um, definitely scanning, um, looking not just at the uterus when we scan, but checking the adnexa. Here we can see a retroverted uterus with a very small and early normally sighted probable gestation sac. Um, 
This is in keeping with about um, a five week gestation. There's a small amount of free fluid with low level echoes um, in the pouch of Douglas. Um, the woman presented with um, pain in early pregnancy um, and we can see here um, left ovary uh, with a corpus luteum and a very small mobile mass. Because of her symptoms of pain and the scan finding, she was taken to theatre and had a left salpingectomy um, and histology did show a coexisting um, a, a, a ectopic pregnancy. Um, she went on and um, this um, was a live pregnancy. It should be said that while we're uh, examining the, um, oh, scanning the patient, if you do see two corpus luteum or lutei in two uh, in both ovaries, and then an extra look for um, to make sure that there isn't a tube coexisting tubal ectopic pregnancy um, is quite important. Thicker lutein cysts are associated with gestational trophoblastic disease, um, such as molar pregnancy, multiple pregnancies, and ovulation induction. Um, they're thought to originate uh, because of excessing amounts of circulating gonadotrophins, um, beta-HCG, and they're caused by hyperplasia of the theca interna cells. Um, and this is the predominant characteristic on histology. And as we can see here, the ultrasound appearance um, is of bilateral multilocular um, cysts of between 4 and 12 um, centimetres. They're quite thin-walled cysts um, and they're described as having a spoke wheel appearance. Um, these are very interesting and I quite commonly see them in the early pregnancy clinic. These are hematomas associated with patients who have had um, caesarean sections and they consist of uh, blood collection between the bladder and the lower uterine segment in the vesico-uterine space and it results in um, bleeding at the uterine suture line and the blood can only go so far because it's limited by overlying peritoneum. Um, so this is what we can see here. In this patient, we've got a normally sighted early pregnancy. The caesarean scar here is, we can see, with some fibrosis. And if you turn in transverse section, we can see the ovary here. And, and there is a sort of teardrop-shaped um, smooth mass um, with this... Um, Ground, almost ground glass appearance. Um, in the literature, they're uh, very often called um, bladder flap hematomas, and a small hematoma can occur in up to 50% of patients um, undergoing caesarean delivery um, with a low transverse incision. And um, it's considered a normal finding if it's less than four centimeters. Um, when I say it occurs up to 50%, um, this is over time, so they may occur um, immediately and, 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 then, and then settle over time. Um, as uh, one of these scar hematomas greater than five centimeters is um, quite uncommon to see and um, can be associated with scar dehiscence. Um, here's another couple of images. Um, so these masses are unilocular and smooth. They're homogeneous and have almost like a ground glass um, contents like an endometrioma and they're avascular. Here we can see on 3D scan, here is the endometrial cavity. This is the caesarean scar and we can see um, this almost teardrop um, mass at the at the level of the scar. Um, it is uh, quite important to see these and to recognise them because they're very often misdiagnosed as ectopic pregnancies. Um, and I've got a video of one just here. So we can see the uterus with a normally sighted uh, pregnancy scene. And here is the mass um, anterior between the bladder and the uterus and it's on the left hand side and we can just see it occurring again just here so it looks very much like an endometrioma small mass and it's moving but attached at the level of the scar just here Okay, so moving on now to uh, gynecological adnexal masses in pregnancy so these masses can be benign or malignant and there are many benign masses, um, some of which are um, extremely common. Uh, corpus luteum, we should see in almost every pregnancy uh, within one or both ovaries. Um, follicular cysts, para-ovarian cysts. Um, we commonly see dermoid cysts in pregnancy, either at an early pregnancy scan, um, or these are very commonly picked up um, at the first trimester or screening um, scan. Less common is end our endometriomas. We see we can see serous or mucinous adenomas, fibromas, 
fibroids and rarely abscesses or hydrosound pinks. And we mustn't forget uterine anomalies can present as adnexal masses in pregnancy. So just very briefly talking about the common common things, common things being common, we often see um, corpus luteum on a scan um, and um, they're important because they produce progesterone and they support the pregnancy in the early first trimester. Usually they spontaneously progress by the eighth week uh, when the placenta takes over progesterone production. Um, this one here isn't very large but it does demonstrate quite nicely um, the circumferential rim of colour known as the ring of fire which always makes me think of Finding Nemo, those of you that have ever watched the film and the ring of fire. Um, so here we can see um, that ring of blood vessels uh, quite nicely here. Corpus luteum cysts um, can be quite large um, but as uh, it says um, they commonly regress by the um, end of the first trimester. Follicular cysts are the most common adnexal masses in pregnancy and again they usually resolve by the second trimester. Um, they can uh, be quite large, um, uh, um, over 10 centimetres. Again this one is um, quite small, um, it measures sort of less than 5 um, centimetres um, and they can cause pain um, particularly if there's a small amount of haemorrhage um, within it. Paravarian cysts are embryological rem remnants of the paramesonephric or um, mesonephric ducts and they typically occur in the mesosalpinx, um, so are like um, our fimbrial cysts, paravarian cysts, and they're not clinically um, significant. This is a very small one here, but we can see it adjacent to the right ovary, moving separately from it, um, and this is probably a very small fimbrial cyst, but again they can be quite large. Dermoid cyst, or a mature cystic teratoma, and this is the most common non-simple adnexal mass in pregnancy. Patients are often asymptomatic, and it's just an incidental finding on scan, particularly in the first trimester screening. Um, the ultrasound features um, are quite classic, and pattern recognition um, should help you diagnose these. Um, they can be bilateral, and their characteristic appearance is of hair and sebum. Um, these are little horizontal striations that you can see um, in the dermoid cyst and there's very often a white ball sign with dense posterior shadowing um, and these are benign cysts of the ovary. Um, dermoid cysts uh, less than five centimetres are usually asymptomatic and can be managed um, conservatively. Derm dermoid cysts are greater than five centimetres there is a much higher chance of torsion so the woman should be um, explained the risk of, of this. Um, here we have um, a video of a patient that I saw uh, fairly recently in my, my scan clinic. Um, this is the abdominal scan. We've got uh, an embryo here. The patient was about 14 weeks pregnant. And um, it's quite a subtle, um, but definitely a dermoid cyst here we can see. Um, so there is the hyperechoic component with dense posterior shadowing, a few horizontal striations. They can be very difficult to pick up actually, um, particularly ones like this that look very similar to the um, adjacent bowel. Um, and looking at the same patient on a transvaginal scan, here's the baby again, and here we can see the cyst moving separately. And particularly if you gently move the cyst, you can get a bit more of an idea of the size. Here we go, so just moving it here, and this is the size here. If you see a dermoid cyst such as this one on um, a transvaginal scan, routine one in early pregnancy, I think it's a good idea to always look abdominally because sometimes um, they can um, appear much bigger abdominally um, and give a more accurate, um, an accurate size than on transvaginal scan. Endometriomas. Um, again, it's quite a common finding um, on transvaginal scan. Um, with um, our current um, scanning, um, endometriosis and endometriomas um, is being recognised um, much more um, um, diagnosed much more on transvaginal scans. So a lot of these women we know already have um, endometriosis um, when they're seen and when they're pregnant. Um, but some are um, 
picked up as an incidental finding um, on on scanning, um, and um, and endometriomas have a diffuse um, classic ground glass um, appearance, which is caused by the presence of blood within the cyst. Um, they can be confused with malignancy um, because in some patients, not all by any stretch of the imagination, um, can have uh, can um, because a progesterone can produce decidualization of the endometrioma and produce these quite florid and vascular papillations that can look very scary um, when you see them on scan. Um, these are generally um, much more vascular and florid in the um, first and second trimester and settle a um, bit towards the late, tr late trimester. Um, they don't need to be managed sur surgically, but um, that should be discussed in um, MDT. And here's a short video. Again, um, here we can see the endometrioma. Is this a smooth cyst? This is a multilocular cyst. There's multiple locules um, with ground glass contents. Here's the baby. Nice picture. I think she was about 14 or 15 weeks there. And um, this endometrioma actually moved and moved quite well, and the patient was asymptomatic. Fibroids are the most common solid masses in pregnancy. However, if they're pedunculated, they can be confused with adnexal masses and in early pregnancy, ectopic pregnancies. Um, due to hormonal changes in pregnancy, fibroids can grow large and become symptomatic, particularly if they degenerate um, when they um, cause red degeneration when they outgrow their own blood supply and can become um, significantly tender. Ultrasound appearances are of a well described um, solid mass with shadowing seen separate to the ovaries. And sometimes you can see cystic changes. Here we have an ovary, and this is the adnexal mass. And actually, coincidentally, there was a very small ectopic pregnancy just next to it. So we've got the uterus showing no sign of intrauterine pregnancy. And then there is the fibroid and a small ectopic pregnancy. Um, this patient here also had two small fibroids that was brought back to my skin uh, clinic to see me. Um, there's a fibroid, sub serous fibroid here at the top, and a smaller fibroid there, which was thought that could be an ectopic pregnancy, um, but these were fibroids. Another couple of images of uh, fibroids in early pregnancy. Here we can see an adnexal fibroid um, with um, classic. Um, um, vascularity surrounding it. This patient here was seen um, at about 10 weeks pregnancy. She'd had a scan done before her pregnancy showing a four centimetre um, probable pedunculated fibroid. However, during early pregnancy, um, she developed um, some pain and the fibroid had doubled in size, um, being almost um, eight centimetres. And there was some concern as to the pathology. However, on transabdominal scan here, we can see some very strong vascularity coming in into the fibroid and these are vessels here um, and this is a stalk of a pedunculated fibroid. Um, and as I said earlier, we mustn't forget that uterine anomalies um, can uh, present as adnexal masses um, and again can be confused um, with ectopic pregnancy as was the case with this uh, patient here. Um, she was seen for um, a, a, an early pregnancy ultrasound abroad and was told that she had um, a n normally sighted um, early pregnancy. However, she bled heavily and when she came um, back to this country had um, her early pregnancy scan, which showed no sign of intrauterine uh, pregnancy. Um, but there was a small adnexal mass, which again was thought to be um, an ectopic pregnancy. Um, she was well, so she was managed conservatively and her HCGs came down, but the patient was concerned about being told that she had a mass. So she um, um, had a um, a routine gynecological follow-up scan and at this time she was found to have a unicorn uterus um, and this is actually the rudimentary horn here um, which is a significantly smaller non-communicating rudimentary horn as we can see here with a small central core of endometrium. Um, you can, of course, get a pregnancy in the rudimentary horn of a unicorn uterus. Um, I don't have a picture of this in my um, 
um, scanning catalogue, um, but this is from that paper that I mentioned earlier, the ESHRA paper about normally cited and ectopic pregnancies. So we have a unicorn uterus here with a rudimentary horn and a pregnancy um, within it, and this is what it looks like on scan. Here is the um, endometrial cavity of a unicorn uterus, and there is an adnexal mass there with a um, pregnancy within it. These used to be known as corneal pregnancies, but should now be um, defined as a pregnancy in the rudimentary horn of a unicorniate uterus. Pelvic inflammatory disease is incredibly rare in, in pregnancy because the thick cervical mucus formed in, in pregnancy is thought to act as an effective barrier. However, of course, you can get um, pelvic infections from other sites, um, such as an appendix, a ruptured appendix, or infection from an, um, a ruptured ovarian cyst or endometrioma. Um, ovarian abscesses are, can also be caused um, as a complication of um, transvaginal oocyte retrieval or embryo transfer. Um, I don't have, again, in my catalogue, a picture of um, PID or infection in pregnancy, but just to remind you what a hydrosalpinx or a pyosalpinx looks like, this is an elongated structure um, um, in, in the adnexa, and we can see some low-level echoes within it. They're very often thick walls and have sort of like this sort of inflammatory appearance around it. And um, here we can see classic cogwheeling, which is um, the little incomplete septums um, all around the fallopian tube. Um, they can be um, very vascular. Moving on to malignancy. Malignancy in an ovarian, in an adnexal mass, um, in pregnancy is incredibly rare um, and um, ovarian cancer is the second most common gynecological cancer diagnosed in pregnancy after um, cervical cancer. Um, the most common form of um, ovarian cancer diagnosed in pregnancy is a borderline malignancy. These are classed as malignants but it's more likely to be diagnosed at an earlier stage so less likely to be invasive and these account for 30 to 50 percent of malignant ovarian lesions. They're usually cystic lesions with malignant um, cytological features, but um, there is no invasion of the ovarian stroma. Um, the ultrasound features are that they're usually unilocular cysts with multiple, these multiple papillations, very irregular looking papillations. Um, and these are very vascular. Um, they often have the um, ovarian crescent signs so and normal ovarian tissue next to them, um, and um, they can be bilateral. With the exclusion of borderline um, malignancies, um, dysgerminomas are the most common um, ovarian cancer in pregnancy, and they account for about 38% of invasive um, tumours. Um, the good thing, well, not good thing, but the positive thing is that they um, do have a good prognosis as they are very um, sensitive to chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And the appearances are of a solid mass. Um, they can contain cystic areas um, due to internal hemorrhage and necrosis, and they are um, vascular. Other malignant masses which are less common are epithelial carcinomas, sex cord malignancies, lymphomas and sarcomas, and we mustn't forget metastases. Um, these are usually um, bilateral solid cysts and um, they are um, most commonly gastrointestinal, um, um, such as the Krukenberg tumours um, or breast metastases. Lastly, we just talk briefly about non-gynecological masses. Um, these can be um, bowel-related, such as diverticular or other bowel lesions. Um, we can have appendix masses, um, acute appendicitis or mucoceles. Some um, uh, simple unilocular-looking cysts can be mesenteric cysts and um, pelvic kidneys. Um, acute appendicitis um, occurs in one in 1,500 pregnancies, so you know is relatively uh, is not uncommon, um, and is the most common non-obstetric operative procedure in pregnant women. Um, pregnancy can obscure symptoms of acute appendicitis um, because the enlarging uterus um, can displace the um, appendix, and it very often um, almost retroperitoneal peritoneal and ultrasound features of an appendix are a tubular mass seen separately to the right 
ovary, often with free fluid and the appearance of a target lesion. So what we can see here is um, a tubal, a small tubal mass. Um, and if you turn it sort of transverse, we can see there's almost like a target lesion here. Um, this appendix has a very small append appendicolith, a very small um, stone within it. Um, and it was inflamed and it was um, um, and, um, was removed at appendectomy. Um, you can also get um, mucus seals as an appendix mass. Um, and these are rare to see in pregnancy, um, but, but can be picked up on scan. Um, this is always a surprise when we see it on scan. Um, sometimes patients know, but sometimes they don't. They say, oh, I forgot to tell you. Um, uh, pelvic kidney, um, um, it's quite unusual, although they do occur in one in a thousand births, and it's associated with other congenital malarian anomalies. And basically it's where an error takes place during the ascent of the kidney in the early developmental stages, um, causing the kidney to remain in the pelvis instead of the abdomen. Um, most patients are asymptomatic, doesn't affect them at all, but there is a risk of con chronic kidney disease. Um, so this is the same patient up here, this is the transabdominal scan, and here we can see the posterior of the cervix, um, that was the ovary, and here is the um, kidney just here, um, so moving separate to the ovary and the uterus. So it does look like a kidney, but just in the wrong place. Main complications of um, adnexal masses um, are of torsion, um, rupture, bleeding, um, they can get infected, although this is rare, and depending on the size, um, they can cause labour obstruction. So it is important to tell um, your colleagues, your obstetricians, um, if you see these masses um, on scan, um, so that the patients can be seen in the antenatal clinic and counselled appropriately. Um, just talking briefly about torsion, um, the incidence of ovarian torsion in pregnancy is between... Um, one um, to five in 10,000 pregnancies. Um, it's interesting, more common in the first and early um, second tri trimesters, probably because the uterus isn't quite so big, um, giving um, the ovary and the adnexal structures uh, room to tort. Um, but interesting, torsion can occur in pregnancy without an, an exal mass. So you can have torsion of a normal sized ovary in pregnancy. So the management of a tor ovarian torsion depends on, um, well, a management of, sorry, an adnexal mass, not an ovarian torsion, management of an adnexal mass depends on the size, um, the gestational age of the patient, uh, the available resources, and of course, patient preference. 76% uh, of um, adnexal masses will be simple cysts of less than 5%, who, uh, less than 5 centimetres, who will resolve spontaneously by 16 weeks of gestation, and they don't require any further follow-up in pregnancy. A follow-up ultrasound should be offered for larger or more complex um, masses at around 14 to 16 weeks of gestation, um, just to confirm no change and um, to confirm the presumed diagnosis. Um, dermoid uh, tumours can be managed conservatively in the absence of symptoms, but particularly if they're above um, five centimetres, the risk of torsion should be explained. Um, and a conservative approach uh, must be reviewed if the patient has any acute pain suggesting suggestive of torsion or rupture. When, with regards to surgical management, um, ideally intervention should be delayed until 14 to 16 weeks of pregnancy to allow for a simple um, spontaneous resolution of any functional cysts and more importantly to prevent surgery on a luteal cyst that might be supporting pregnancy or um, surgery affecting um, this luteal phase. And the indications for surgery are an acute abdomen, a mass suspicious um, for malignancy, any cysts greater than 10 centimetres, which may, and may cause obstruction to labour, and any rapidly growing masses. So, for example, an increase in size of greater than 20%, as these are much at a much higher risk of malignancy. And this is an algorithm um, that... Um, 
many um, management of Adnexal masses are based on. Um, so an Adnexal mass seen at ultrasound, um, obviously if they have pain and they have an acute abdomen, they should go straight to surgery. If they're asymptomatic and uh, the cyst is thought to be benign, um, and if it's less than five centimetres and simple, no further action is required. If it's uh, greater than five centimetres and simple or more complex in nature, um, if there is a cons any concern, they should be rescanned in four to six weeks by an expert in ultrasound. If the mass is resolved, no further action in pregnancy is needed. But if there's no change in size, then it is sensible to organise a rescan postnatally and a gynaecological review. Um, if the morphology of the mass is suspicious of cancer or indeterminate, again, they should be seen um, ideally by an ultrasound expert and their opinion should be given using the IOTA criteria. Um, um, if not, there is, there are, the patient may need to have an MRI scan as a backup. Tumour markers can um, be taken, such as CA125 or LDH, um, but these um, are sometimes not particularly helpful as they can be raised in pregnancy anyway. Um, all of these um, indeterminate or suspicion of cancer should be discussed in the local gynae MDT. If there's still a low index of suspicion of cancer, then they can be managed relatively conservatively, but if there is high suspicion, um, then they should have surgery. So in conclusion, adnexal masses are commonly identified in pregnancy, but they're rarely malignant. The principal goals of assessment are to diagnose acute conditions such as adnexal torsion and to determine whether a mass might be malignant, necess necess necessitating intervention during pregnancy. As the first line investigation, an ultrasound scan can be reliably used to characterise most benign and malignant masses, particularly when using the IOTA criteria. This hasn't actually been um, validated in pregnancy, but there are future studies um, planned um, to um, do just this. MRI scan can be used to characterise indeterminate or suspicious features. Most adnexal cysts resolve spontaneously in the second trimester and the predictors of persistent cysts are a diameter of greater than five centimetres or if they appear more, more, um, more complex at imaging. Pregnancy can alter serum levels of tumour markers, making the interpretation of these results difficult. Surgery in pregnancy is indicated in cases of an acute abdomen and a high suspicion of malignancy. And a multidisciplinary approach is required, taking into account women's age, gestation, parity, desire for future fertility and the likely stage of disease. So lastly, I'd just like to go through a few cases that... Um, I've seen in the in the early pregnancy unit. Uh, first patient is 32. Um, she was seen um, on one of my routine scan lists as a follow-up. Um, she had had no previous gynae history operations. Um, this was her first pregnancy. Um, um, sorry, she wasn't pregnant. This is a routine gynae scan. She had had one child and, and um, she was born by cesarean section. So she was scanned in pregnancy and found to have a unilogular cyst um, on her left ovary, um, greater than five centimetres, um, and a normal right ovary was described at the time. Um, this cyst was reviewed at the anomaly scan and um, documented that the cyst was still present, but it was documented as a right-sided cyst, not a left-sided cyst, and um, it was advised that she should have a postnatal scan. The postnatal scan showed a normal uterus, um, but the sonographer um, commented that within the right adnexa superior to, and seen separate from the right ovary is a 57 by 20 by 28 millimetre mass. She was unsure what this was, um, so um, she asked for a rescan and I scanned her a few weeks later and uh, confirmed the presence of this right adnexal mass, high and separate to the ovary, um, measuring six, approximately 60 um, millimetres. The contents appeared thick and in keeping with mucin. It was avascular with some minor shadowing um, and the walls um, did appear thick and in some views there is an onion skin appearance. Now when I say onion skin appearance what I am referring to uh, is almost like a layered appearance in the wall and up here as well. There was no obvious sinister features or stones seen. And here we have a little video of this mass that I saw. 
So here we can see the tubulous mass, quite thick walled with some gloopy mucinous contents within it, seen separately to the ovary. And there's there's the right ovary there, and also separate, moving separately to the uterus. The patient was asymptomatic, this was not tender at all. So my suspected diagnosis was of an appendix mucosal. Differential diagnosis um, was of a Meckel's diverticular mucosal, um, but that's very rare. And just uh, reviewing the images um, for the of the first scan um, at the pregnancy scan, this was the left ovary um, here with a small physiological looking cyst um, and this was commented that this was the right ovary but actually if you have a look it's probably the same structure as I was seeing at her follow-up scan. So the plan was to refer her back to her GP and advise a surgical review and she was seen in surgical outpatients four months later. She was still asymptomatic and they advised a CT scan. The CT scan confirmed the presence of this tubulum tubular structure and said that the base of the appendix looked normal as does most of the body but there was uh, the tip of the appendix was inseparable from this structure and it was closely aligned to the adjacent adjacent terminal ilium um, so um, they weren't sure, exactly sure what it was um, they thought it could be a Meckel's diverticulum or an appendix tip mucosal and they thought the MRI uh, that an MRI assessment might be helpful MRI wasn't particularly helpful um, this showed an unchanged appearance to the tubular right ilex fossa structure, which had a small tail, which could communicate with the small bowel or the appendix, um, but they couldn't dif differentiate um, between a Meckel's diverticulum or an appendix mucosal. So the patient eventually went to theatre um, and was diagnosed with a mucosal of the appendix. Everything else looked normal. Um, there was no evidence of any abnormal peritoneal nodules or free fluid. So they performed a laparoscopic appendectomy. And the histology came back showing a low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm. These are known as LAMs. Um, it was completely excised. And what a LAM is, it's the sort of equivalent of a borderline um, mass in, um, in an ovary. Um, they... Um, some of these um, have malignant potential and if they rupture or have some microinvasion they can lead to a condition called pseudomyxoma peritonei which is like um, which is a, ca a cancer of the appendix and this produces thick gelatinous mus mucin and um, metastases all over the um, peritoneal cavity. So quickly, just to go through uh, what a muc mucosal is, it's a dilated mucin-filled structure, most commonly caused by epithelial pr proliferation, um, benign or malignant. It can be caused by obstruction or inflammation. And in the small bowel, they're most commonly an appendix mucosal. This has an onion, spin onion skin appearance that I was describing earlier. Um, a chronic Meckel's diverticulitis can also lead to mucosal formation. Um, appendix mucosils are usually because of obstruction of the lumen um, leading to mucin accumulation and they're an asymptomatic um, and very often an incidental finding such as it was in this case on transvaginal scan. It's four times more likely in females and can have this classic appearance. As we can see here, an elongated structure and it has these multiple layers like an onion skin and this is thought to be because of partial obstruction of the lumen and accumulation of um, gelatinous mucin under different pressures. And as I said before, they can be benign or malignant and um, a neoplasm of the appendix um, can lead to pseudomyxoma peritonei. Meckel's diverticulum, just because I've mentioned it and you may be all uh, trying to wreck your brains and remember what a Meckel's diverticulum is, as I was. <laughs> um, and this is a very common congenital anomaly of the GI tract and it's caused by failure of the vitiline duct. This is what connects the yolk sac to the midgut through the umbilical cord to regress in the embryo. Um, interestingly, it might have ectopic, pancreatic or gastric tissue within it. It's often blind ending, but it can attach the anterior abdominal wall um, and um, cause um, bowel obstruction as bowel can loop around it. Um, there's a rule of two with the anatomy. It occurs in 2% of the population, so it's quite common. Two feet away from the ileal cecal bowel, two inches in length, 
much more common in males and usually presents in um, young boys at two years old. And these children are diagnosed by a Meckel's scan scintigraphy, and this is basically where it picks up the gastric mucosa. So we can see um, um, the stomach here and a little bit of the same gastric mucosa down there in the right iliac fossa. Meckel's diverticulitis is caused by gastric acid secretion from this ectopic gastric mucosa and symptoms are similar to acute appendicitis and often misdiagnosed. The fluid collections can be thick and um, have very thick walls, again with this classic onion skin layered appearance of the walls. Second case um, is of a 28 year old um, grabbed a 2 para 1, she'd had a caesarean section in the past and she was seen in the early pregnancy unit with pain and bleeding at 7 weeks gestation. Um, on her transvaginal scan there was um, no evidence of intra or extra uterine pregnancy seen um, but what was noted were these bilateral hemorrhagic cysts arising from or close to the caesarean section scar, not typical of an ectopic pregnancy. Normal ovaries um, and she was diagnosed with a pregnancy of unknown location. Her HCGs decreased in keeping with a miscarriage but as we can see here um, we can see this is a transverse section of the uterus. Here we have a cesarean section scar, and here we have one of those le oh, sorry, one of those lesions here. And on transverse view, um, a slightly better transverse view, we can see one lesion there and the other one there, and looking almost like a um, Mickey Mouse um, view of the um, of the uterus and these lesions. MRI confirmed the presence, um, she was followed up um, to find out what these unusual appearances of the cysts were and she had an MRI and this showed unusual rounded fluid collection anterior to the uterus, not obviously infected or abscesses and um, these were thought that they could be evolving hematomas or seromas and she had a laparoscopy sometime later and this confirmed the presence of these unusual peritoneal cysts. Um, two thin-walled circular lesions with mucinous um, material within it and a they are located at the UV fold at the level of the bladder attachment to the uterus and were thought to be um, um, cysts associated with the um, caesarean section scar and with what I um, showed you earlier these are probably um, what's known in the literature as bladder flap hematomas. Case 3 this isn't, strictly speaking, um, a adnexal mass found in pregnancy, but it um, does have repercussions um, from her pregnancy. So I thought it would be interesting to show you today. Um, this patient's 41. Um, her history is very interesting. She um, was referred to me to exclude endometriosis, as it was thought her left ovary was adherent to her uterus. Um, her, her original referral was for the left-sided pelvic pain associated with her periods um, with pain rating down to her lead leg. It had been going on for the last eight years but worse recently. She has no dyspareunia and occasional pain when opening her bowels. No contraception or hormones for the last 10 years and when I heard all this my initial thoughts were maybe endometriosis. Um, Interestingly with her history, she told me that she had a laparotomy for an abdominal pregnancy um, age 18. Um, she said that she had had excruciating pain through her lower, um, through in early pregnancy, but as she was um, only 18, she was told she was being very dramatic um, and she'd had scans and showed a, um, a normally sighted pregnancy. Um, but at 32 weeks, um, she had symptoms of rupture and was rushed to theatre um, where she was found to have an abdominal pregnancy with the pregnancy um, attached to her sigmoid colon. Um, in future pregnancies she had um, a planned caesarean uh, section for a breech presentation and the second pregnancy was also breech and was delivered very rapidly at home. Her previous scans for pelvic pain had not shown anything. So um, when I scanned her, we saw um, uh, what appeared to be a normal uterus on um, on longitudinal section. We could see the caesarean section scar here, and this is the transverse section at the fundus of the uterus, showing the um, endometrial cavity. And we could see here a mass, which was thought originally to be an adherent left ovary. 
Um, however, um, on further scanning, the right ovary appeared um, normal and the left ovary was quite um, lat was laterally seen um, but was present and seen separate to the mass. So we can see the mass here and, the, and this is the left ovary here. And um, here is a video showing a very small fibroid and the mass on the left hand side, left ovary mass, uterus sweeping all the way through to the right and the right ovary and then in transverse view cervix scanning all the way to the fundus and here we can see the mass here which separates, seems to join the uterus here and then separates off So here is um, still images and I think what is noteworthy here is look at the transverse view of the endometrial cavity, it's quite round and on 3D scan you can see that she had a unicornic uterus with one interstitial portion of the tube here. This is a classic banana shaped appearance of the endometrial cavity. And then on rendering the image, um, we can see a mass here. And this is a rudimentary horn with a small central core of endometrium just there. It's a non-communicating horn. And again, um, as I pointed out earlier, this is a, um, um, a normal shaped endometrial cavity. And when we look in transverse section, um, we can see... Um, the endometrial cavity is quite long and sometimes it sort of looks almost like a happy smiley face I, I describe it as to my students and then in a unicorn uterus the endometrial cavity is quite round and this is a one way of, ha uh, of telling on 2D scan but obviously 3D scan um, you should get this sort of appearance please forgive um, the basic nature of my cartoon and again just to have a look at this unicorn uterus and here is the rudimentary horn. And the reason that I included this in this lecture is because I think it is quite interesting. Um, obviously, we can't say for sure, but it could be that she had a pregnancy in the rudimentary horn with her first pregnancy as a teenager, um, and this ruptured in early pregnancy. Um, however, um, implanted somewhere else, so she had almost like a secondary abdominal um, pregnancy. Um, and then with her next two pregnancies, um, they were both breech, so they were probably um, within the uh, unicorn uterus. And as we know, um, pregnancies and congenital anomalies are very often um, mal have malpresentation um, because they can't move around so well. And the last case is of a 25-year-old primogavida who attended for a nuchal scan, which showed a viable intrauterine pregnancy of 12 weeks, and the pregnancy was normal um, for that gestation. However, no, it was there. However, the right ovary was expanded by a 123 millimetres multilocular cyst that contained six locules with some irregular internal wall material noted. Vascularity um, was quite strong, um, so she was referred uh, to me for um, a follow up scan. Um, she was well, and the history um, showed that she'd never had any pain on the right-hand side. Um, there was no relevant history. Um, she'd had a scan the previous year due to bleeding after her Mirena coil insertion, and the ovaries were both documented to be normal at that time. She had some dysmenorrhea, but no definite history or investigations for endometriosis. Um, and my scan showed um, that arising in the adnexa was a grossly abnormal vascular multilocular solid mass containing at least six locules, all of which had multiple florid irregular vascular papillations. Um, the contents of the locules appeared low level um, in keeping with mucin or possibly even the ground glass appearance of an endometrioma. The left ovary also looked abnormal, but less so. There was a small unilocular solid cyst with some shadowing. Contents were also low level, um, and the small solid component um, had vascularity on TA scanning. Um, the right ovary was not seen separately, um, and so this was presumed um, to be ovarian, and the uh, features were very suspicious of an ovarian malignancy. Um, it, 
the possible differential diagnosis um, were, was of endometriomas, which can, with decidualization that can appear florid in pregnancy, she had no history of endometriosis and a normal scan um, just the year before, in, um, as this was in 2017. Um, so um, we're concerned that this um, mass was a malignant lesion um, and she was referred um, to our MDT and um, she was it was decided to have a right salpicoinfrectomy which was performed at 18 weeks gestation. Um, the macroscopic appearance of the left ovary appeared normal and there was no obvious um, pelvic um, deposits. The histology came back as showing a FIGO 1A atypical proliferating serous tumour with focal papillary um, architecture and some microinvasion. So, um, and this is also known as a serous borderline tumour. These are epithelial cell tumours and they are at an intermediate stage between a serous cyst adenoma and a cyst adenocarcinoma. Um, they are um, they occur in 2.5 out of 100,000 women, so quite rare, and they are often bilateral. Um, Microinvasion invasion is seen in 25%, more commonly in pregnant patients as high as 80%. Most patients are of childbearing age, and 70% are diagnosed at stage one. Um, but in general, these tumours have an excellent disease-free survival rate after surgical treatment of 97%. And this is what they look like um, macroscopically. You can see here the internal papillations um, that you see on, on ultrasound scan. Um, so that's the end. Thank you very much for listening. These are my references. And once again, apologies for not being able to be with you today. Um, if you do have any questions or would like to um, speak, to, um, contact me in any way, this is my email address. Thank you very much.